pushed us with a plethora of information that we are totally ignorant about. And they put the evidence in front of us uh, with, uh, there was some material there that uh, needed to be looked at. Uh, so we, we took it from there. And um, I, what I like to say to the MS patients, that I, I don't like to call them MS patients, I call them our colleagues. Because uh, they've been you know, most helpful in our cause and most helpful in uh, giving us the support to do this. And um, most of them I find uh, very intelligent, very uh, internet uh, literate, and uh, uh, they, they're the best source to get uh, information around the net. Okay. So we know about this, uh, you know, the CCSVI uh, people before me have talked about uh, uh, definition of CCSVI and the problem that happens in the picture on the left shows the stenosis internal jugular and uh, reverse flow and reflux into the brain. Okay, and similar histology slide was shown uh, uh, before showing uh, the MS plaques around the vein with the uh, iron hemosiderin developing around the vein and which may uh, have a cause, be a cause for uh, starting the cascade, autoimmune cascade into causing uh, MS or at least it might just worsen the condition of an MS patient. If, if, if CCSVI is uh, a malformation that was, is uh, found at birth associated with MS, so it may be that CCSVI makes things worse for the uh, natural history of the MS disease. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is, this is talking about the autoimmune theory, which a lot of people now are challenging. And we all, all we just wanna see here, say here is that that might be triggered by overloaded uh, iron and oxidative stress. And this is, you know, a typical picture that, similar to the pictures was shown by my colleagues, showing a typical finds that we see during venography on patient uh, with MS and CCSVI, and here showing on the left-hand side uh, a narrow uh, distal end of the um, left internal jugular, significant collateral around proximal area of stenosis at near the uh, C1, C2, and then another major collateral going all the way uh, down. Um, now, to comment on this, I, I, I think one of the things here is that uh, we need to, to learn is that uh, this picture doesn't give us the whole story. Uh, for reasons similar to what Sal said, that you know, the dye might uh, overlap the actual pathology in the distal end. And another thing is that most of these proximal areas of narrowing at what is what I call a functional or physiological narrowing, secondary to a severe narrowing in the valve. And there was a paper uh, by Zambonian group that uh, uh, a consensus that CCSVI is a malformation at the valve rather than any of the stenosis. And I do, after doing 120 patients, I, I have many evidence of if you do treat the, the valve and then take your time. So what I do is that I go to one side, uh, look for the pathology, treat the valve, ignore all these other proximal lesions, and then I go uh, to the right side and then to the asgus, and then come back, which is probably takes me an hour, an hour later, back to that vein and, you know, inject it, and you'll find that these physiological or uh, uh, functional lesions have disappeared. Now, what the other thing that we do is a little bit different is that we do an ultrasound 24 hours before the procedure and 24 hours after the procedure. And, and uh, we have never seen any of these lesions persist 24 hours. So if we were able to actually do a venogram 24 hours post dilatation of, of the valve, all these lesions uh, will you know, have disappeared. And we do have that in, all, in our protocol for all patients that we repeat ultrasound 24 hours later. Now, this is just for, uh, we give this talk for general uh, people in Kuwait and for physicians that telling them that we know that the valve, uh, sorry, venous problem in the leg and uh, abnormal valves cause congestion which might lead to swelling and redness in the leg and some of the clinical manifestation down the leg is this ugly picture of ulcers the scaffolding and uh, uh, swelling, redness. So 
you know, it's, it's the same human body. So if you have congestion of vein in, in the leg causing this, you know, why does not obstruction and congestion in the brain giving similar picture within the brain? It's just, you know, the, the difference here is that we can have a look, lift our trousers and have a look what's going with our legs, but you can't open the head to really see what's going on. And unfortunately, whatever imaging we have now uh, for the brain does not really tell us the whole story about the damage or the inflammation or the injury that happens in patient's brain, NCCSVI or any other clinical condition. Okay. Now, um, this is to answer the question uh, that a lot of neurologists say that uh, the procedure is dangerous and is not safe and shouldn't be done. We've been doing uh, venous dilatation uh, all over the body. You know, I've, I've been doing it for more than 17 years, and most of my interventional radiologists have experience in arterial and venous. Venous veins are safer than arteries. You know, this just shows a picture here of using cutting balloon to dilate a significant narrowing in a shunt vein with the dilatation. So this is not new. This is the, the, the treatment is not new. This is just a new application of an old technology, an old treatment. Okay, the question is to use, whether to use a balloon or a stent. A lot of people, you know, uh, ask this question, don't like the fact that we are constrained now by the fact that we only use balloon uh, because of a single case of you know, migration of a stent. Now, this is a paper that was published uh, in Kuwait uh, by our, in 2005, by our, uh, from Kuwait, sorry, it's in, in the Journal of uh, European Neurology by a neurologist from, a neurologist group from Kuwait that shows that the incidence of uh, MS is on the rise, especially among young Kuwaiti women and it has increased from 2.26 in 100,000 in 1993 to 7.79. That's a very high number in, in 2000. So, you know, it, it, that just shows the urgency that things need to be done, you know, and, and that was one of our motivation to start this in Kuwait. So after uh, the good uh, MS Society, people from of the, the good people of the uh, MS Society in Kuwait came with the evidence and showed us the, uh, the material and asked us for help. We said, well, we're going to look into this first. So we decided to just scan patients and see, you know, whether there is any relationship between CCSVI or venous nar narrowing and uh, MS. And so we took 100 patients, control group, and this is the statistics of the patient, and we found that 93 uh, percent of these patients, normal uh, patient, non-MS patient, were had a normal duplex. Only seven percent have uh, a positive duplex. Now, interestingly, out of the seven percent that has a positive uh, duplex, uh, all of them had their measurement was just below the 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 average. Sorry, the the cutoff line. So none of them have severe stenosis. Um, and, and they just, just made the criteria. They were not, none of them had severe uh, or significant stenosis. And one of the patients, looking to the history of one of the patients, we found that her brother had an MS. So she was worried about that, and so she asked us if we have an MRI in the brain. And so we did an MRI brain, and voila, she has a paraventricular, you know, lesions, which it's not a diagnosis of MS, maybe it is, you know, uh, pre-MS diagnosis as was described earlier, okay? Maybe these patients, if we follow them up with time, we'll find that they will develop, you know, MS uh, later, okay? So the other group was uh, 100 patients with MS and the results according, we did them according to the bonus criteria ultrasound that 87% had a positive duplex scan and when we used an MRV, uh, there was 96%. That's, again, is consistent with what Sal is saying and other people that maybe MRV is, is uh, overestimating areas of stenosis and showing, you know, uh, steno functional stenosis that we're, you know, calling them a significant stenosis. So I would stick with the duplex for now, and that was the result of 87. So there's a significant correlation between CCSVI and the, um, uh, there is a strong link. And so, uh, comparing the, our study with the other studies, Zamboni showed 100%, Zivadinov uh, showed 20, 55 to 62, Mamoun showed 84, Simka had 90%, and ours was uh, 87%. Now, uh, after doing this, so we decided to do an initial pilot study. 
and we decided just to take 10 patients, of course, that went up to 15 patients before we were shut down, like everybody else. Okay. Uh, these are the percentage and statistics for the patient. All of them had a positive duplex and positive MRV. We decided that before we do any patient, they have to have a positive duplex and positive MRV. And sign a, a informed consent. Uh, we did a venography of both the jugular, terminal jugular, and azygous veins, and when we find stenosis more than 50% or persistent reflux, then we did, went ahead and did a balloon venoplasty. And, you know, like everybody else, we used the anticoagulant afterwards, and the patient was discharged on the same uh, day. Now, I must say about that in our pilot studies, like everybody else who starts this treatment, we are, we are very cautious. I, I must admit we were afraid of complications, something new. And uh, so we use small balloons, okay? We use size 10 and 12 balloons. Now, um, no, we didn't have any complications. Uh, all the patients had satisfactory, and all the patients, all the patients reported improvement at one month. And that was, again, typical to the symptoms that associated with CCSVI, like loss of fatigue, improvement of power, sorry, Loss of fatigue, improvement of visual acuity, reduced electrical sensation, memory improvement, and headache is gone. Now, we were surprised we got some patients had improvement of power. Two patients had foot drop has improved. They, were able, they could not drive uh, using a cane. They could not drive a car before. It was right foot. And these two patients, a week after procedure, they both went and rented the car and they started driving around because they haven't driven for years. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, we also notice is improvement and disappearance of numbness. Now, what symptoms that have improved greatly are patients who were at the late stage with, with uh, uh, disability, high disability score. So really patients who are bedridden or you know, wheelchair bound with an ADS more than seven. Uh, we've done two of these patients. Now, neurologists criticize that they haven't got up and walk. But we, they knew, the patient knew, we didn't know that they did not get up, uh, get up and, and, and walk. But they, they, they to them, the, the improvement in fatigue, uh, the uh, loss uh, or reduced spasticity, uh, better control of the, of the neck and head, better swallowing and better breathing was a major improvement in these two, two patients. So uh, our conclusion to our pilot study that uh, there was a strong link between CCVI and MS and maybe the, the iron deposition triggered the inflammatory uh, process uh, and CCVI may not be the, the cause or the, the main causing factor uh, to MS but there is certainly a clinical uh, correlation and the pilot study showed that the procedure is safe and it, uh, it, it, uh, it does, the procedure has some positive results. In this phase of study, the patient population did not have a proper neurological assessment by documenting severity of MS symptoms or using, using a proper M, uh, M, uh, a score, neurological uh, score. So that was a criticism for our pilot study by our neurologist. So we decided to, to apply for a proper uh, a study, double blind, well, not, we won't call it double blind study, but a proper study protocol with involvement uh, of uh, neurologists. Uh, we did that in April 2010, and then uh, beginning of April 2010, by the end of April 2010, sorry, we did that in the end of March, and the beginning of April 2010, we had the Ministry of Health approval for a nation nationwide study uh, for patient MS with both positive CCSVI. Uh, and that the, all these patients will be assessed by neurologists before and after at one month, three months, six months, and one year. And the neurologists were free to use any score that they want. And, and our future obj uh, objective was to audit our results with respect to the diagnostic modality, clinical improvement, radiological improvement using MRI, and neurological assessment with uh, as many scores as possible. Now, one of the things that uh, the Minister of Health has told us that you can do the study, but you're not allowed to use stents. So even when, when we put in our protocol that stents may be necessary to correct, you know, uh, complications of, of procedure, we were prohibited. So, you know, again, this is something, you know, I, I'm now going to do an angioplasty, and if I have to use a stent just to correct a uh, uh, complication, I can't. Now. 
Now, what I want to talk here is just these are little bit uh, tips uh, for intervention radiologists who is just starting uh, to do this. Um, uh, that the valves of the internal jugular vein are lie just lateral and superior to the acromioclavicular uh, joint. Uh, the curved tip glide wire, especially to Rumu, is best to, to navigate through the valve, and it's best done during expiration. So at the end of expiration, this is the time when the valve opens, and that's where you find the opening within the valve to, to be able to, to go through the valve and, uh, uh, with the uh, curved tip to Rumu. The best catheter I found, we've used the multipurpose catheter, uh, a headhunter, but I, the um, vertebral catheter, 100 centimeter, is usually the best to, to navigate into the opening of internal jugular veins. The left lateral oblique image to access the azygous vein at 30, 40 degrees. This is just to access, but you can use different degrees of 70 or lateral, just like Sal uh, said, to actually image the whole azygous. But to, the easiest way to access the azygous vein is using a Cobra II catheter, okay, and this many manufacturers uh, at 30, 40 degrees, and it's just this way it will give you a direct, if you aim just to the left side of the patient, and you can easily access the entrance of the azygous vein. Um, now we do our venography during inspiration and expiration. This is just what Mark committed about his case, that maybe that during the, that the case was done when they find it normal during only inspiration. But you have to do the venography during inspiration and expiration, um, uh, similar with the azygous. Okay. Now all narrowing were dilated with valvotomy balloons we use balloons from a company called Balt, is a, is a French company. They only manufacture uh, valvotomy balloons for, to use for the, uh, the valves of the heart. So these are tougher balloons and uh, they are better to use to try to distort the, the valve. What we're trying to do here is that we're not just trying to dilate the valve. We need to distort the valve. We need to damage the valve. We need to, to, to cause it as much damage as possible so not to have a thick uh, valve which is causing narrowing. So use everything is possible to, um, to, dial, uh, to, dial, to try to damage the, the valve. So we use a valvotomy balloons and we use a two, start with a two milliliter balloon bigger than the nominal size. Now I have a problem with people saying okay we used only 12 and 14 size balloon but most of the internal jugular vein is, is dilated to probably 18, 20 millimeter balloon. So a uh, 12 and 14 balloon gonna do nothing, okay? And the best thing is to actually not to restrict yourself to a single size, so I'm only, I, I can only use up to 14 size balloon. What you do is that you start with whatever you think is, is suitable, 12 or 14 size balloon. Start, just say start with a 12, and then you do, it, you do dilatation for two minutes, three times, and then re-image the, the, the vein again. And if you see a reflux, that means you know, you have to go to the bigger size. And you continue doing that process. It's a process. It's, this, these procedures take a long time, from two to three hours, okay? Uh, the, the, you can't do it less than two hours, okay? Because you have to go through that process, it's a time-consuming trying to damage that valve, trying to open that valve. Now, my average balloon for the right size is size 18. My average balloon for the left size is size 15, okay? It doesn't mean I start this, I start with and the left side, I start with size 12, and then I probably use 15. On the right side, I start with 15, I use the 18, and sometimes I use 23 size millimeter. And that has no L effect. Now, after 120 patients using all these big balloons, I don't have a single complication related to the size of the balloon. I do have complication I'm going to talk about, but nothing to, related to the size of the balloon. Okay, it might surprise some, but this is our experience. And uh, I just want to talk about our initial pilot study, which was 15 patients. Now we've done 50 patients uh, as part of the national uh, study, and then another 120, uh, sorry, another 70 patients as, uh, on, in the private, not part of the national study. Now, out, out of our initial 15 patients of uh, the pilot study, eight of them came back with restenosis. How do we know that they have restenosis a month later? How do we know they have restenosis? Is because they came back with symptoms. Exactly the same symptoms, the symptoms rec recurred. So we did an ultrasound and all of them had stenosis. Okay, all these patients went back on, on our, uh, they went into the, our national study database and they were done. They had a priority because they have 
failed study uh, initially. And we, start, we dilated them with you know, bigger size balloons and wires and cutting wires that I have learned from someone else. So again, my advice to anybody who wants to start this is to learn from someone else who has experience. Okay? Uh, and these patients are now three months, four months post the procedure, and they don't, none of them have uh, restenosis and none of them have uh, recurrent of symptoms. In fact, the first, our protocol that calls for um, uh, MRI of the brain comparison at three months, you know, all of them, all of them have reduction in the number of lesions after three months using the, the, um, the bigger balloons and a new technique. Now, the best size, length of balloon to you is, is three centimeters. Two centimeters is too short, four centimeters is too long, okay? We do two minute dilatation three times for each uh, size balloon. So if we start, say, on the right side, we're gonna use 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, that's five balloons. Each balloon have to be used for three times, two minutes, and then an exchanging in between and checking by contrast. So you cannot do, each side takes around 35 to 45 minutes on each juggle, internal juggler. Now, uh, the left side is usually smaller and it's usually tighter. So you may need cutting balloon, and the only cutting balloon available, the, the biggest cutting balloon available is eight millimeter in, in, in uh, diameter and it's two centimeter in length. Unfortunately, I wish there were bigger cutting balloons that make my, our life much easier, but I start with, with this to distort the, the, the valve and then I use a bigger balloon after that. And I'll show you cases before and after with the cutting balloon and what happens to the, to the valve. Now, we have cases. This is just some example of the cases. Okay, but I can, I'm gonna show much more after that because Sal asked me to show as many cases as possible. This is an MRV and again, you know, it shows a compression of the uh, internal jugular by the carotid bulb on the left hand side and a little bit more compression on the right side. It's not very clear in here, but this area of proximal dilatation just before the valve, that gives me an indication that there is a problem with the valve. This is typical what you see. And here, it is, this, is, this is again, there's a thin line in here that's similar to what Sal was talking about, is that sometimes you, know, you, you only see a thin line. And what you have to do, back to what Mark was saying, is that you need to use the 3D imaging of the MRV to try to find the, the stenosis. You, so you need to look not just on an AB view, you need to look at, at a 15 degrees rotation and looking at the distal part of the uh, internal jugular, some people call that proximal part of the internal jugular, looking at the stenosis. And this is a typical case with a normal looking uh, internal jugular, um, but collateral, and we used balloon. What, during, what, what's seen here is that I sometimes, I was just discussing this with one of my colleagues here, sometimes use balloons trying to find these webs and area of stenosis that cannot be shown uh, on actually venogram. And you can see here there are areas of stenosis, you know, that can be seen only by applying the balloon. And then the valve here, you can see there is area of stenosis distal and the valve. And this is an image afterwards, so the collateral has disappeared, and you can see that the distal part of internal jugular is wide open. And this is an, an image, again, the azygous, this, you know, there is a reflux in here, but we don't really see any significant area of stenosis, and so you wonder why is that? Why is there reflux, abnormal reflux? but there is no area stenosis. And I will come to that later, but again, I share with most of my colleagues who spoke earlier, is that there are valves in here, you just don't see them, and there are web. This, in the, in the arch, you, have, you would see at least two to three valves, and they are significantly narrowed, and you can only detect that when you do the balloon. When you use the balloon, to inflate the balloon, then you will see the severe uh, valves and severe area stenosis. And in this area, just distal to the, to the arch, there is usually webs, and you can detect this by balloon, and you can see the balloon actually as you inflate it, the pressure drops as you cut these webs. Another case in here, you know, showing uh, significant stenosis, uh, a distal uh, internal juggler using a balloon, and this is, this is an 18 size balloon on the left hand side, and this is the result. And you can see here, the valve 
is now wide open. I don't know if you appreciate this. There's a thin white line here and a thin white line here. These are the valve cusps that, that are open now, okay? And uh, after using a big balloon. And again, a picture of the uh, azygos, and you can see, this is a typical picture you will see just, just at the distal to the arch, and in the arch, significant area of uh, stenosis you can only appreciate by doing the balloon, and this is balloon, post balloon angioplasty. How big was that balloon in the azygos? 12. I always use 12 millimeter balloon, 12 by 4. The best balloon is Bowerflex by Cordis. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying this. I, Disclosure, I have no relationship with any drug company or any medical company or equipment company, but this is the easiest balloon because it's very flexible and very thin and it's the best, easiest to go uh, around the, the arch and into, through the valve of the, of the azygos. And so you see, this is a 20 millimeter balloon. So a 20 millimeter balloon and this is the opening. So don't be afraid to use large size balloons. Okay, can, can we just go back to the other presentation? I just passed, let's go through this. Now, this is a typical uh, normal uh, image on Doppler showing the blue vein and the uh, red artery. And this is the, an area of the carotid bulb causing compression and stenosis and reflux into the internal jugular vein. Here, again, significant stenosis with almost complete reverse of the flow is now red rather than normal blue, and this is the carotid bulb. Uh, Cross-sectional image ultrasound showing the carotid uh, bulb causing external in, uh, compression of the internal jugular vein. Okay, I must say this is a multidisciplinary team, and you need vascular uh, unit, you need a neurologist, radiologist, uh, interventional radiologists, and this, this, this is our team as part of our study. It includes two vascular surgeons, uh, vascular laboratory specialist, Dr. Mizaini, and uh, neurologists. Now we have added another four neurologists, which is good news to our study. Can we just say um, uh, the other uh, stu study, please? Yes. No, uh, can, is the video live? I just want to say that it's a testament to Dr. Tariq that the coordination of this didn't happen because okay. a patient pulled him aside and asked him some questions, and he gave him his full and complete attention. And also another testament to Dr. Tariq, and I have a vested interest because my name's Kathleen and I'm his patient, he wanted to show the human side of this. And I think that's very telling of him. And he asked for this. Kathleen is uh, one of my patients from the United States, and uh, um, I've asked her to talk about, uh, you know, her, her experience and perhaps put it in a video before uh, the procedure. And what I'm going to do, which she doesn't know, is that I'm going to ask her to talk to the audience about how she feels after the procedure. But let's just have a look at the video uh, beforehand. And while you're waiting for the technology to catch up with us, this is for the patients out there. Um, you know that a lot of this communication has been fueled by 
Facebook manifestos and YouTube communiques. And so this is in the spirit of those patients. It's interesting how the um, power shift has occurred when patients have a lot more information than they ever used to. Uh, Dr. Tariq, oh, let's hear it for the patient empowerment. <laughs> and maybe for the healthcare practitioners out there who don't know this, we have been posting videos on YouTube of our disabilities um, before the treatment and then our ability post-treatment. I think I'm a walking testimony with my four-inch heels on right now. However, as I took a look at my pre-video, it's very evident I was experiencing cognitive impairment at the time. And all it is is 10 minutes of... Hi, I'm Kathleen. Dr. Tariq has asked me to post my pre- and post-angioplasty videos. However, as I took a look at my pre-video, it's very evident I was experiencing cognitive impairment at the time. And all it is is 10 minutes of rambling talking head, and you don't get to see my disability. So what I've decided to do, and don't worry, I'll make it quick. I know you want to hear from Dr. Tariq. I'm going to do the Reader's Digest reenactment of what my life was like. I'm going to invite you into my humble home and more importantly into my personal hell of those six years of MS. So join me. I would wake up here, draw a big breath, ask for strength to get through one more day, and I would get out of bed, and here's the hardwood floor where I'd hit my head when I fell, or if I stayed on my feet, here's the wall where I missed the door jam. This was the safest part of the house for me because the walls are so close together. I would use them to stay upright. After I successfully navigated the hallway, I would go to the front door and grab my cane. Sometimes one, sometimes two. I walked like I was drunk, and oftentimes I'd use the canes to signal to people that I really wasn't drunk. My husband affectionately referred to me as Lurch. Here you see the entry to my home, and notice that the stairs of the porch have been ripped out and replaced with a sloping ramp. This wheelchair was given to me by the mother of a childhood friend. My friend Roxanne, who used this wheelchair, she died of MS. Here's the chair where I spent the majority of my days, mostly reclining. And about the only thing I could handle intellectually was the E-channel. I remember once being incredibly thirsty and the glass of water was sitting right there. But the effort of sitting up and reaching for it was more than I could muster. Here are the books I couldn't read because I didn't have enough concentration to last a sentence. I'd read the first half of the sentence, and by the second half of the sentence, I wouldn't remember what the first half said. This is a picture of me giving my final address at graduation as faculty. I had to give up a career I loved, a career I was born to do, because I, I could not do simple math in my head, and my goal was to facilitate the synthesis of abstract concepts. I could no longer do that was devastating for me to say goodbye to these girls. 
They just lined up and marched their way out of here, leaving me with my worst nightmare, Keens. <laughs> then at the end of the day, I would go to bed earlier than most people, deeply fatigued. The fatigue had dogged me all day. And I have to admit that I would think to myself, if I stop breathing in my sleep tonight, it would be a relief. Here I am with my mom in happier days. It's too late for her. She died of MS, December 2007. It's not too late for the rest of us. I just remind everybody that Kathleen is a professor of uh, telecommunication and multiculture, and I, I will just ask her to give me two minutes about how she feels now. Post, how long is the post procedure? Two months. Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to just want to tell people? Post procedure, I experienced relief from 28 symptoms. Uh, amazingly, I can close my eyes and tilt my head backwards and rinse conditioner out of my hair. And I find that to be a very important skill. <laughs> if I would walk forward and turn my head sideways to talk to the person I was with, I would lose my balance. I know where my feet are at all times. The fatigue has lifted. I am tired now because I have so much energy. I'm doing too much. I can do simple math in my head. My feet stay. I know where I am in relation to time and space. I have, my vision has sharpened. I, most importantly, and for me, the symptom that I've received the most relief from is this very creepy, detached sense of reality I had from having an inflamed brain. So. I feel like me again, and I feel like Dr. Tariq has given my life back to me. And I'm incredibly grateful to all the researchers in CCSVI, all the patients who had advocated for so much change. And I think it's remarkable that we are on the cusp of a major medical paradigm shift. And it doesn't come easily. People don't like change. And I think with the expertise uh, and experience, just the sheer numbers coming out of your study with the increased dedication and learning that's going on by these conferences, we have nowhere to go but up with this. It's incredible. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to show a few more cases, you know, for the intervention radiologist to share some of the experiences, and then I'll be done. Okay. Uh, we lost that. Okay, this is a patient showing, um, again, an injection. You know, I kind of disagree a little bit with people saying that you don't have to inject, you know, all the way up. I think you have to inject, you know, start from up and then inject at the valve, uh, just above the valve and then at the valve. So, you know, I, I, that's what I do. I, I just go all out. And, and in fact, in order, this again, and another tip, in order to make sure that you are in the azigus, because a lot of time you're not sure, then what I do is that I put the catheter, you know, as high up as possible, not, not that high, maybe to, to the chin. And then I use the, the wire, the trauma wire, to push the wire into the brain, and then I can see that it's going through the sigmoid sinus into the brain. So I know that I am in the, in the azigus. And then I inject to just demonstrate things like this, which is narrowing in the, in the internal jugular at the, at the level of the carotid bulb. And you can see here, you know, most of the radiologists here will appreciate that, that there is a dilatation here, which represents the valve, and there are two 
cusp valves that's open in here, which shows that this is the area of pathology. So this is using a, a, a 14 millimeter balloon. This is an 18 millimeter balloon. And this is the image before, and this is the image after. And you can see, you appreciate that the, the appearance here, it has uh, disappeared. Okay, on the left side of the same patient, there's a lot of collaterals. And again, the malformation described by Zamboni, and as talked about er earlier, that uh, aneurysmal manifold innervation just a, represents an abnormal valve. Uh, using a balloon to try to find most of the pathology, because looking at this picture, this is too dark. You don't really know what's going on here. But, you know, rather than spending too much time trying to find out, but, uh, I put a balloon, and the balloon tells me what's going on. There's two areas of stenosis. There is, there is probably a web uh, in here, and this is the abnormal valve. And this is a, a 15 millimeter uh, valve, valvotomy balloon. And you notice here that there is a wire, and this wire is outside the balloon. So I use an extra wire outside the balloon to try to distort the valve as much as possible with the use of valvotomy balloon. I only do that if I use a regular balloon or a valvotomy balloon and then I find that the results are not you know, adequate because there is a little bit more reflux and I know that I don't need a bigger balloon than this because this balloon you know, is showing, you know, it's not open uh, fully. So by using the wire, and I use something called Mercedes technique, which is I use the wire at, uh, uh, straight behind the, the balloon and then move the wire to the right side and move the wire to the left side. And this way, I, I do it as many times as possible to distort the valve. Okay. And this is the image uh, before, and this is the image after. And what you notice here is that you know, the, 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 the flow, there is you know, very dark uh, contrast in here. That's, that's because you know, the stasis that happens before the valve and showing, you know, while here you don't have time for stasis to happen, it's just the whole thing is washed out very quickly. Then you have to do that during expiration, during expiration. Okay, now the azigus. Now, is this a normal azigus? Not much reflux into any, any things. But looking at this, this is not a clean looking vein. There is what seems like these little areas of, of you know, ulceration or abnormalities in the wall of it. And, you know, to me now, I didn't know at the time, but now I know these represent multiple areas of uh, web within the, the azicus. So while before, when I started, I used to look for significant stenosis, and if only I find significant stenosis, I balloon it. Now I put a balloon in all these patients, okay? And since I started putting balloon, it was about 95, 96% of the patient would have an abnormal valves and webs within their azicus, and you might as well, I mean, the patient came all the way, went through the procedure, might as well try to clean that, uh, that azicus vein as much as possible since we don't know all the answers and don't know all the information. So to me, um, I, I'm gonna give the patient the best shot by cleaning his azicus, okay? And this is just a proof that on that uh, earlier azicus that you can see the indentation here, especially in the arch, that shows you know, the valve and another area just distal to the arch of, of narrowing within the azigas. You can see them if you use balloons. Again, another area of dentation, and you keep inflating the balloon and you, until you, you dilate it, and you dilate that area, and you're, uh, um, this is another patient with a clear area of stenosis, very narrow stenosis here on the right-hand side. The rest of the uh, internal jugular looks normal. Now that's so narrow, and the best thing for this is you probably best to start with a cutting balloon, okay? So uh, after a cutting balloon, I used uh, a 12 millimeter balloon, and then this is a 14 millimeter balloon with using the Mercedes, again, the wire outside, okay? Now, you see the difference here, that's how much dilated in this to this, okay? I don't know, to normal people, interventional uh, radiologists are probably gonna appreciate how much dilated this is. To other people, they may not appreciate it, but I will tell my interventional radiologist, look at that contrast, how uh, diluted in comparison to this. It's the same amount of contrast, same concentration. We don't change anything, but here is because most of it is flowing down, it's not stagnating. And the most important thing to look for after the procedure is the reflux. Is not the narrowing, how much narrow is still left, is where there is reflux. The end point is that when there is no reflux on inspiration and expiration. Okay. 
Uh, another case on the right side with narrow, obvious narrowing. Okay, uh, 15 millimeter balloon with external wire. The wire, the external wire has to be a stiff wire. So the best wire is a super stiff wire from Boston Scientific. That causes as much, the, the best damage to the valve. And then using an 18 millimeter balloon, okay, with the wire. You see when you put the wire, see here on the right hand side and you inflate the balloon, you don't get that indentation because the wire has, is causing damage to the valve. So you lose that indentation that, uh, that you will get with using regular balloon. Now, this is on the right side, and this is a 20 millimeter balloon, and you can still, that there is still indentation on this. Now, how, how wide is this? This is probably an 18 millimeter or 16 millimeter opening, and this balloon is 20 millimeter opening. So, the question is that an opening of 15, 16, or 14 millimeter, you know, in, in the vein may not mean that this vein is open. You might still have reflux, so the end point is not how wide is the opening is whether there is reflux or not because you're talking about valves and you, if you have an apparent opening like this which looks wide open but you inject a contrast what will happen is that the valve as soon as you remove the balloon the valve went back to its normal position and you still have reflux and you haven't achieved anything so you have to have to try to damage that valve uh, so in this case if you know if you after this you check and there's still you know, there is reflex. What you do it then the next step is to put a wire and try to damage the wire with external wire, stiff wire. Okay, so this is before and this is after, and you can see, you know, the the, the difference. Okay, on the left hand side, interventional judge will appreciate that there is absolutely no flow. So this is like almost complete stenosis narrowing here. Now I know directly from here that what I need to do is, is just put a, a cutting balloon, and. One thing that you be careful when you use a cut balloon for the first time is that you are not going to say see an indentation. So don't worry when you don't see indentation. You think, oh, I must be in the wrong place. No, the cutting balloon you don't see any indentation in cutting balloon as you inflate it. Okay, so we use a cutting balloon, and then this is 12, and then this is a 14 size balloon, also with external wire, and this is the before and this is the after. Now. And the azygous of the patient with a lot of reflux, abnormal reflux. Now again, it doesn't seem to be there is any significant areas of stenosis, so, but we put a balloon and in the balloon, again, just distal to the arch, there is an area of significant stenosis you can appreciate with the balloon and you just keep inflating and you try to open it. And one thing that you notice, I use a pressure balloon. I wasn't a fan of pressure balloon, but what you do with the pressure balloon is that you don't close it. You keep uh, raising the pressure to the normal pressure and you will notice that as the balloon cuts through the web in the, in the vein, the pressure will drop. So you have to maintain it. You have to keep raising the pressure, raising the pressure. And the end point is when the pressure doesn't drop anymore. That's when you know that you have dilated this or you cut all the webs inside or the valve is, is, is wide open. How high are the pressures? Sorry? How high are the pressures? Uh, each balloon has a nominal pressure. No, no, I don't measure the pressure. It's the pressure of the balloon. How much pressure are you recording in the balloon? Well, each balloon, the, for power flex, usually you can go up to 10. Okay, the, each balloon is different. Valvotomy balloon, maximum is five atmospheric pressure. Each balloon comes with its own normal pressure. Sometimes I just go a little bit more than, yeah, than what's required because you, know, you have a range before you get a, burst, a bursting balloon. Okay, this is the same patient. Again, another valve seen in the middle of the arch, and we have dilated that valve. Now, this is the before, and this is the after. So, it doesn't seem we've done anything, changed difference in the arch, but actually, just this to the arch, maybe there is an apparent here dilatation, and that reflux is gone. And now you see more contrast going into the normal azygous distally. Another case, on the right-hand side, significant stenosis, balloon, similar with uh, cutting wire, okay, the before and after showing normal dilatation. On the left hand side, similar using balloons, big balloons, don't be afraid on the left hand side with a cutting wire outside, okay, a before and after. Now here, again, you don't appreciate much of dilatation, but the amount of contrast, how it goes through, it's uh, less diluted uh, and no reflux. Azygous, again, using balloon, even if there's no stenosis, you can see now two valves, you know, abnormal valves, 
indentation in the balloon, and you keep raising the pressure. Now, if you increase the pressure, use a 10 millimeter balloon, a 12 millimeter balloon in the azagus, in an area where there is no valve or web, the patient feels absolutely no nothing. You know, they will tell you nothing. But as soon as you put the balloon in the valve area or in the web, they will, you know, they will feel it. It's painful. You have to be prepared for it, and you have to give the patient just before dilatation enough, you know, painkillers and medication because they will feel it. And that's another clinical proof that, you know, that these valves are abnormal, these valves are clinically significant. Okay. I just want to show an interesting case here. Yes, here, this is before, this is after. Obviously, there is, you know, big difference, dilatation in the area of the valve in here, and you can see that the vein has actually that, that possible area of significant uh, long area of narrowing. Mark, is Mark here? Mark, I believe. Oh, okay. He was showing me a case just now similar to this on an MRV, and I just told him that we, you know, we probably can help the, that patient. But because once you correct the valve, you see that thing is almost gone back to normal. Now, you can see it's still persistent uh, collateral. One of the things the endpoint people talk about is that collaterals are gone. Well, if the collaterals are gone, this is great. You can uh, document it. But if it's not gone on this run, it doesn't matter. Because again, if you leave this alone and come back an hour later, you will, find, you will find out that that collateral has gone. It's all hemodynamic. It's all physiological things. It's all, you know, functional things. You have to be, we have to, you know, be careful about the, the functional. We don't go after everything. So a lot of people, when they see this collateral, say, oh, we have, I haven't done enough. But if you don't see reflux in here and you still have persistent collateral, again, you know, go. And that is proven on the 24-hour ultrasound that we do for the patient afterwards. And my, my colleague who does this, you know, shows, you show me wonderful, totally normal veins where earlier, 24 hours earlier, they showed multiple areas of stenosis and a lot of, a lot of collaterals. Again, a similar to picture to what Sal shows, that there are area of valve, and you see the cusp here, very obvious in the valve, uh, of, uh, at the origin of the azygus, or just a part of the argus as it joins the subvenous vena cava. And in and, and this area, your, as you get experience, when you find difficulty accessing the azygus, that means that this is significant stenosis. Okay, so if you have difficulty, go ahead and dilate that area because it's probably significant stenosis. And you can see here, you know, that, you know, multiple areas, common areas, the middle of the arch, proximal part of the arch, and just distal to the arch, all these valves, abnormal valves that needs to be dilated. Now, this is about 20, 20 millimeter size vein in a very young patient. Okay, with an abnormal valve, as you can see in here, and you can see the twisting of the vein proximally, and this is, looks dilated, this is, looks probably normal here, this is twisting of, of the vein. Okay, went ahead and dilated with a 15 millimeter balloon with external wires, and then with this case, we used 23 millimeter balloon. And you can see the difference before and after. I really don't care about the, the size in here. What I care about is that the amount of contrast is now less and is diluted because there is no reflux, and you appreciate that on live image. But you see this area of this twisting and narrowing is now gone. It's disappeared. It's corrected itself. You just have to wait for it. Okay. On the left side, no contrast here. This is significant stenosis here. You know this patient and collateral. This patient needs cutting balloon. Okay, so first of all, we use a regular balloon, a 12 millimeter balloon, and you can see that there is still very, very significant narrowing on this balloon and a 12 millimeter balloon. So that, it doesn't matter now what you, you, there's nothing. You don't have any chance to dilate this anymore with a regular balloon or a bigger size balloon or using wire. The only chance is if you have a cutting balloon. So this is a cutting balloon. This is what I'm talking about when you use a cutting balloon, is that you don't see any indentation. You don't see anything. It just opens straight ahead. And then what we have seen here is that after, after using cutting balloon, we have developed one complication, which is, you can see here is a little bit of dissection, okay, and a fold in after the, but if you look at the distal part, how wide open now, this is wide open, with this little dissection, we, we still this can see the collateral coming from up. We did correct this by putting back a 14 millimeter balloon and inflate it for three minutes. So this is a 14 millimeter balloon that goes through the area of stenosis and upper in the area of the dissection. 
Okay. I, sh I put this image. This is the image of the regular balloon, the 12 millimeter balloon before the cutting balloon and before that. And this is the image of the 14 millimeter after the cutting balloon. So the cutting balloon does make a big difference. Okay. And this is the image before uh, the procedure, and this is the image at the end of the procedure, and the dissection is gone. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Yep. Stand up and make yourself. Yes. Uh, what's the anticoagulation regimen during the procedure and after the procedure? Your, uh, just before the procedure, two hours before the procedure, patients get uh, two tablets Plavix. And then during the procedure, there are full hybridization around 5,000, sometimes 6,000. 5,000 for females, 6,000 uh, international units for, for males. Post procedure, everybody goes on aspirin, Plavix, and you know, mini hip or Plexane for three days. You stop the Plexane after three days, you continue the Plavix for two weeks, and then you stop the Plavix for two weeks, and they go on aspirin for six months. Another question? Yeah. In the azigus, yes. In the azigus, how about in the jugular? In the jugular, no. Um, uh, I, 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 do, I do rely on, on vinogram. I do rely on vinogram looking for reflux and looking, looking for stenosis, but I don't rely on it as much looking for things perhaps like what Sal is doing, looking for the actual abnormality, that whether there is a web, whether there is an inverted valve, whether there is a valve. You know, if I see a reflux, my, my my end point is the loss of reflux. So if there is a reflux, that means there is obstruction. So I use the balloon to, to dilate and damage whatever there is, perhaps without documenting as good a cell all the actual abnormalities and the, the valves, where they are, where the web is. Okay. You have one more? Yeah. Well, I think, no, it wouldn't. Uh, like. My other colleagues who do use stents uh, around the world, the stents are reserved for when you have either complication or you can't achieve the end point. So if you do all the dilatation and you still have reflux and there is no way to go, uh, so stents is the best uh, solution. I think the future, the problem with stents right now is I'm not as much worried about stent migration because if you put the stent, the stent will migrate if you put them in the wrong place, if you put them above the valve. If you put them in the valve, the valve by itself will hold it in place. I'm just worried that right now the stents are not designed for veins. They, they need to be uh, less uh, damaging because they're made for artery. They need to have a different shape. They have to need to be conical shaped. So when you put them in place, they don't migrate because the proximal part will be bigger than the, the lower part. They have to be more accurate because you're talking about a valve, you know, which is you know very small area and the self-expanding stents that we need to use are notorious for jumping or moving, not, not staying precisely in the right place. So I need a precise, self-expanding, less damaging, less metallic stent with a conical shape going downwards, okay, to, to put it in the vein. I'm, I'm working on it. I think that's my next invention. That's how I'm gonna make my money. Okay. Complications? Yes, we, we, we got one patient had uh, thrombosis, uh, uh, one out of, this is 120 patients now. One patient had thrombosis 24 hours post procedure, which we picked up on the ultrasound. This is the advantage of the ultrasound after 24 hours, that you pick up thrombosis early, you can treat it. And this lady was treated with uh, increasing the klexin uh, instead of three days to two weeks, and that, that thrombosis was a significant area of thrombosis with total thrombosis that disappeared and the vein went back to normal uh, two weeks later. 
we have the dissection, as I, sh I showed, and that was treated just with inflation of the balloon. We do have uh, one patient with extravasation of contrast. I think it was just injected rapidly into the wall. The catheter was against the wall rather than an actual dissection. And again, just putting the balloon back for three minutes at the area, you know, took care of, uh, of this. Um, the other thing is that our first experience showed, you know, restenosis. I wouldn't call that a complication, but, you know, I wish that we know what you know now, that we wouldn't have uh, restenosis related to a procedure. This is, uh, I don't mind, you know, if restenosis is going to happen, it's going to happen, but if, if I can, if I have a better procedure and I can avoid the restenosis, that's, that's better. <laughs>